So welcome, thank you for joining us this afternoon. Uh, we're here with Tatton Asset Management who are going to talk us through their interim results. Uh, we will start with uh, Paul Hogarth, CEO. So over to you, Paul. Oh, thank you, Hannah. And good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, yeah, thank you very much for your time. Just to run through our um, interim results uh, that are obviously issued today. First of all, starting with the divisional structure, pretty much as it was, so I won't dwell too much on this slide, but Tatton Asset Management, the PLC, with the two separate divisions running underneath. Um, Tatton Investment Management, um, which is the sort of lead position within the group, um, very much a platform only with a low charge challenger model type uh, investment proposition. Uh, and we'll obviously talk a fair bit about um, Timmel moving forward. And then on the right hand side, uh, you've got the IFA Support Services Division, which <coughs> encompasses Paradigm Consulting, the IFA Compliance Services Business and Paradigm Mortgage, the, uh, the mortgage aggregation business that we have within the stable. So if we can move on to um, key highlights on slide eight. Um, where I don't really want to focus on, on all of them. Um, we had a ch slight change in style. We normally give a trading statement which um, talks about FUM, but this time we wanted to talk about profitability and group revenue really to put everybody's mind at rest of, of how we've performed obviously in this COVID period that we're um, discussing. So pleased to see that group revenue had increased and obviously uh, profitability up 21%. Uh, and obviously the margins increasing as well. So all very strong, but I really want to focus on three uh, aspects. Um, one, the fact that we've upped our dividend. Um, so the dividends increased by 9.4% to 3.5p uh, payable in December. Uh, and really um, further evidence, if you like, of our confidence uh, in the group and our positioning and how robust uh, the business has been and will continue to be. So every confidence in raising that dividend at a time when obviously others would not be in a position to do that. Um, and starting from a, you know, a relatively strong financial position with net cash of 13 million and a new banking facility that we've added on, which gives us access to 30 million of, of funding to support growth. And when we talk about growth, you'll see from the slides moving forward that that is really focused on M&A activity um, that's where we, we uh, believe that that money should be spent. Um, and we'll come back to talk about that um, later on in the deck. So, you know, pleased to see that the FUM has increased over that period. We had new net flows for the six months of 328 million. Uh, and, um, you know, over the whole year, it was 1.1 uh, billion of growth. So that's fantastic. And I think that's testament again to the work that everybody has done when they moved across to, to working remotely uh, and supporting the IFA base that we have. Um, and now actually with the market sentiment improving, obviously in the back of the vaccine news, um, I'm proud to say that we've actually gone through another milestone. So we're in excess of 8 billion now, 8.134 as we sit here today. Um, also made good, good progress on the number of firms that are supporting the Tatton Investment Management business. I think that number would have been even greater if it wasn't for COVID's interruption. Uh, and we'll talk um, again later on about IFA engagement and how well we're doing with that and also what we believe the outlook looks like. But, you know, whatever we, we, ha we, we have got, we're optimistic, obviously, about where we are. We're optimistic about the market. We're optimistic about where we sit within the market. But everything has to have a a tinge of realism added into it, obviously, as we are in now in lockdown two, and we are still in, in, in these COVID times. So uh, I'm afraid, you know, we, we uh, whilst we're optimistic about the group, um, we must obviously keep an eye on, on the fact that we're still within that particular um, position. So I think realistically, uh, what we'd like to say is that we believe those flows of 300 and 28 million is likely to be repeated for the second half. That's the sort of number that we would would feel comfortable about putting on it. Um, but as I say, that's, uh, you know, we can't really get any much more excited about going back to our previous levels until we see how this settles down. When we went into COVID, we were absolutely flying. So uh, the final um, sort of quarter, if you like, 
you know, we had record levels um, and, you know, uh, it's a shame that obviously COVID came for many different <coughs> reasons. But um, as I say, we, we look to get back to normal levels as soon as possible. Our long-term relationship with Tenet goes well. Um, we, we've got a tremendous relationship with the Tenet group. Um, both sides um, are, are very, very pleased with that. Uh, and if we could achieve any more strategic partnerships such as Tenet, we'd be delighted with that. I think I, I said it was like Christmas Eve when we got that particular um, um, contract and, and you know, it's a contract that we're very, very pleased with. We've got 93 firms supporting us now with over 376 million there. So Justine and the sales team have done a great job on that. And then we've got uh, Paradigm Mortgages, um, which again, we'll talk about in, in detail because obviously the mortgage market is very much in everybody's thoughts these days. Um, obviously took a dip when valuation revenue stopped uh, on the back of uh, the fact that the valuers couldn't go out on, on, under lockdown. But I'm happy to say that that's now um, not the case and, and everybody's back at work there and we're seeing revenue come back in there but we have a case study for you to run through that in Paul's section later and then Paradigm Consulting uh, going well with its membership increasing by two and a half percent probably um, that you know that division not really been affected by COVID because we worked remotely with the IFA so we support anyway and we just really further enhanced that that work that we're doing um, so that's the sort of key highlights. Um, I pause for breath there and let Paul run through in greater detail the financials and then I'll pop back later to give you the expectations of where we see the market going. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, pleasure to be with you uh, this afternoon. Um, so Paul's taking you through some of the highlights. Uh, I'd just like to take you through the, um, uh, the financials in a little bit more detail. I think broadly, and it's very positive performance in what's been a very difficult last six months for everybody. Um, you know, the, we've highlighted our key KPIs there uh, in bold, and obviously the group revenue at 12.6 has delivered adjusted operating profit of just under 22%. Um, I think the, 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 the margin significantly increased actually from, um, you know, a sort of 42 to 46, uh, or just under 46%. Uh, and one of the benefits that we've had uh, from lockdown is a slight reduction in our costs. So the travel and expenses, while it's not uh, significantly material, it, it's not immaterial either. It's a couple of hundred thousand. So we've, we've benefited there. So it's nice to think that there's some benefit come out of um, the last six months. Um, from a split perspective, typically, historically, our split's been a sort of 46-54 split. Um, at the moment, we're, we're sort of forecasting a 50-50 split. Um, and that's where we are. We're, we're sort of 50% of the way there in terms of the um, consensus forecasts that are out there. So in, in a relatively good shape um, for the rest of the year. Um, adjusted fully diluted um, earnings per share increase in line with the operating profit uh, up to 6.5p. And as Paul mentioned, you know, we're very pleased to be paying an interim dividend, which typically historically has always been on a sort of one third, two third basis. If I could just sort of bring out as well some of the, the adjusting items. Uh, the first one would be the share-based payments. Um, share-based payments effectively is a catch-up from the previous year. At the end of March, we uh, removed the provision for share-based payments, um, purely related to COVID. I mean, if we go back to March, back eight months now, um, it was a very difficult period for everybody. You know, our AUO fell by at 1.1.3 billion, which had a significant impact on um on the forecast uh, as such you know we've actually done very well over the last six months as these results prove and we've had to uh, reinstate that um provision and then the other point would be the exceptional items of, of two hundred thousand, and that relates to um an unsuccessful acquisition that we bid for and um, we got quite far down the track with that acquisition it's a five billion aum so not insignificant in size um, it happened to be the Architas um, funds. Um, I think we run a very disciplined process through that. Um, and overall, um, it was um, pretty well controlled from a cost perspective. Um, we're very, very disappointed not to, um, uh, to win out in this particular um, acquisition. It was, a, it was a very strong strategic fit. Um, but, you know, we live to fight another day and, and we'll remain disciplined uh, as we look forward uh, to future acquisitions. Moving over to the next slide on, on page 12 is the, the group balance sheet highlights. So we have a very robust balance sheet. We've, we've got net assets that have just increased to 20 million now. 
I think the key number, obviously, for everybody is obviously the cash number, 13.3 million in cash. And we have a very strong, therefore, financial liquidity position, which, as we all know, is different um, to just having a strong balance sheet. But strong liquidity is, 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 is very beneficial. Um, we've added to that by putting in place a new facility, a 10 million RCF facility, which is committed for three years. Um, we also have an uncommitted, what's called an accordion facility, which we can draw on at very short notice should we require that. Um, I think the key here is that, you know, this now gives us firepower uh, in the future for further acquisitions, um, in addition to Symphony, which we made just over a year ago now. And I think what it helps us do is show any potential seller that we actually have the balance sheet and um, the commitment um, to actually pursue and move quickly uh, should we need to. Uh, moving on to the next uh, slide onto group cash flow, and it's just a, a simple bridge just to show um, the operating cash after exceptionals was 4.2 million, and then some of the key components that make up our cash flows. Um, we exercised um, the 2017 EMI options, and we had income of, of 1.4 of that. Obviously, the, the 13.3 million is after paying a 6.4p dividend at the end of March um, 2020, so the final dividend of last year. Um, and then in addition to that, we obviously have our, our, our normal tax, um, the borrowing transaction costs that we incurred and a relatively modest amount of um, capex, um, which left us with a 13.3 million at the end of the period. Going on to the next slide on, on page 14 is the divisional uh, performance. You'll see uh, Tatton, um, you know, very resilient performance over a six month period. Um, it's not to say that, um, the general performance wasn't affected by COVID. I think it was. You know, the firm numbers have grown quite healthily, 4.9% up to 624, and the inflows at 328, you know, in comparison to the industry, are actually quite strong in comparison to sort of a percentage of AUM. That said, as Paul mentioned earlier, you know, we weren't on the pace of the final quarter of uh, last financial year or the first quarter in, in this calendar year. Uh, nonetheless, as you can see on the on the graph on the right hand side, you know, Tatton's continued to grow strongly. You know, it's got a compound annual growth in revenue of 20% over the last three years. And um, it's pleasing also to see our AUM return to pre-COVID levels of the 7.8 billion. And actually, as we sit here today, is now at one point, uh, sorry, 8.1 billion. Moving on to Paradigm. Um, Paradigm is, as, as a division took a little step back. Um, as you can see from the table on the left-hand side, so um, the, the adjusted operating profit is 100k behind uh, this time last year. Um, it's actually about 150, just below 150, so rounds down to 100k. Um, consultancy was broadly largely unaffected, um, but the, the the mortgage business, which we'll, we'll touch on on the next slide, was a little bit more affected as you would expect um, in the first quarter of this year when times are very difficult. Um, if you look on the right hand side where the graph uh, um, shows historical performance, what you'll see that Paradigm effectively is a single digit, high single digit growth business. And the only reason why it's fell back this year is because of COVID. So if I just take you to the next slide in slide 15, we've put a case study side, slide in there for the impacts of COVID on the mortgage business. And the first point I would I'd, I'd bring you to um, would be the, the green box in the middle, the mortgage lending. And when you actually look at that, our, our lending actually increased in the period by 4.7% to just under 5 billion or the associated lending. Um, and if you compare that with the income from lending, you know, you've got a, an increase in the actual mortgage lending, which has actually caused a slight decrease in, in the income. So the volume's gone up, but the actual mix has changed to cause a slight decrease in, in revenue. So that's because we completed more remortgages, product transfers, as opposed to sort of new first time buyer type mortgages where the uh, the bits related to that are slightly more rich. Um, protection GI come was largely unaffected. Where we really um, experienced some, uh, some pain was in the valuations income. So going back to the beginning of March in lockdown one, you're, everybody will recall that you know, the mortgage market pretty much came to a halt. It was impossible to conduct valuations uh, and clearly that associatively uh, affected our income. And, you know, as we look to where we are today, that, that market is uh, relaxed a little, valuations are happening. 
um, albeit you know the vast majority of valuations are still desktop valuations where the uh, the income is slightly uh, lower uh, in comparison. So as we look forward, you know, where are we now? Well, you know, there's been clearly a significant amount of pent up demand. If I told you that we just had a record month for applications, um, that may surprise some people, but that's where we are. I think clearly the stamp duty holiday um, and the sort of desire for homeowners to change their um, living environment is clearly having an impact on that. I mean, there's some key industry stats uh, which show that the mortgage is in pretty healthy state, actually, uh, as we sit here today. You know, July, for example, um, was running at 52% ahead of the, the prior year. And clearly, you know, that was the, the pickup from, you know, from Q1. Um, and also house prices, you know, according to Nationwide, have also increased 5% year on year. That said, you have to temper that with the fact that, you know, there's a level of restrictive lending, you know, so in terms of affordability concerns, uh, also lenders, you know, restricting loans at higher LTV, LTVs. And obviously we still have the specter of unemployment as well. You know, obviously that's a cloud over the, you know, the future, um, which will play out over the, the next six months. Um, so that said, what I would say is that I think whatever happens going forward in the next six months, it's not going to be as bad as the last six months. I think we've proven within our mortgage business that we can weather the storm. And um, I think, as I said earlier, it's been a really uh, resilient performance from Paradigm. If we could um, now move forward to the market overview and then have a good look on slide 17, I thought what would be of interest to, to uh, our viewers would be to have a little look at IFA activity um, sort of during lockdown and, and where we are now in lockdown two. So uh, as you can imagine in March when lockdown one came, IFAs were very much um, really trying to work out how they would deal remotely with their clients. So they were set into into dealing with that and didn't have any time to engage with us uh, and, our, and our sales teams about moving to Tatton. So obviously we saw engagement drop. Then we've seen a nice gradual increase on in that engagement from April onwards. Uh, as you can see, that went quite nicely until we got into the uh, depths of the summer holidays and it came off a little bit for summer. And nice to say that the, you know, the engagement is increasing as we speak. And, um, you know, we would expect that to continue. I think the IFA themselves are potentially struggling to, to actually get in front of brand new clients. They're servicing existing as best they can and remotely, and that seems to be working fine, but they really are, you know, not back to, to, to speed at all in, in attracting new, new clients in. Um, and the younger uh, elements have done better than the older ones with regard to that. But you can imagine that a lot of uh, older clients would not want to either visit the IFA if they, if they were allowed to, um, or even have the IFA visit them at home. So um, we need to see that engagement coming through. And as I say, we need to see the end of, end of the restrictions to, to actually have that and be able to, to move forward at a greater pace. Um, if we think about the demographics as well, if you, you know, the IFA has now proven that um, they can deal with people um, remotely and can deal digitally um, uh, with engagement with their clients. And that really has got rid of a few geographical barriers that those IFAs might have had and that they can now attract clients from outside of their own jurisdiction or out of, outside of their own geography, whereas before it was difficult to do that. Um, so that, 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 that will be good news moving forward. What we've done on the next slide, on slide 18, is sort of just go back and look at how the market that Tatum plays in has grown and how we expect it to grow from here. So we've gone back to when we floated back in 2017. And when we floated, uh, there was about 449, 450 billion of assets sitting on platforms from IFA. So, you know, platforms like Integrafin, uh, AJ Bell, um, you know, uh, Novia, uh, Fidelity, all, all those usual uh, Transact, Nucleus, etc. So we've watched that grow and grow from 2017 through to 540 billion where it is now in 2020. And then if you look at the smaller circle um, on each one of the, of, of the um, circles, you can see that the DFM MPS, i.e. the world that we live in, 
has grown from 25 billion when we when we floated back in 2017 now to 54.5 billion that's very much how we predicted it to go that we thought that there would be more and more coming into the dfm mps space and we've grown our share from 4.4 billion up to 7.8 and as you can see, our share of, of, of the actual overall has remained pretty, pretty similar throughout. So what does that tell us? Well, that tells us that, you know, we expect that market to continue to thrive and grow. I think everybody expects the UK advisor platform market to continue to grow. And some pundits have suggested it could be up to a trillion within the next five years. And on that basis, if we were to continue with our same market share and the trajectory is the same way, you could expect to see our AUM double from the 7.8 to the 15, 16 billion mark. Um, so, you know, we're, we're, we're very, very excited about that. There's an awful lot of white space in those circles to go at. Um, and we believe that there's going to be more and more uh, importance and dependence on the DFM MPS service, which reduces the cost of investing for a lot of the investors who are in the traditional discretionary fund management arena. I'll come back to that shortly. But if we look at the next slide on slide 19, we're really showing how, um, how successful we've been with attracting new firms into the fold. Um, we've now got 71% of the firms that support us are from outside the paradigm business. We've got really good, sturdy performance from those paradigm firms. Uh, and we now know the level of assets that we've achieved <coughs> from the paradigm firms over the period of time we've been working with them. And we believe that most firms have an average 40 million of available on platform for, for the DFM MPS. And we've got about 26.3 of that 40 from the paradigm firms. But very nicely, you can see that the non-paradigm opportunity is obviously where we are now with them of about 6.8 million per firm. If we were to reach the same saturation level as we have done with the paradigm firms, there's, a, there's an opportunity of 8.6 billion there to add to the, uh, the number that we have already at 7.8. So if you, sorry, 8.1 now. If you look at the bottom chart, um, you can see that over the years, that non-paradigm opportunity has increased and grown from 5 billion now to 8.6. So again, that's a good, good number. So. I suppose what we're saying is if the market doubled, then we would go to 15, 16 billion if we had kept our same market share. If the market stood where it is and we were managed to get as close to those firms that we're working with now as we have done with the paradigm firms, we could get a further 8.6 billion on, on top as well. So um, slide 20 is uh, us appearing for the first time in the top 25 UK wealth management company list, which is lovely to see. I'm, I'm particularly proud of that. Okay, we're a bit further down, but it just shows you the concentration of the wealth within those firms and also includes those integrated models, such as SJP and Quilt Achievement. And you can see the numbers there from that. So the, the, there's a big concentration of the top 25 with the assets that are out there. But the number that attracts me really is the number that's sitting in private client land. So there's 48% of that pie chart within those 25 UK wealth managers that sit uh, effectively off platform in private clients' hands where the custody is still with the discretionary fund manager or the integrated wealth manager. Um, now, I believe that number is fairly static. People are dying and are not being replaced. Um, but that's a great opportunity for those IFAs who maybe have placed those private clients with those DFM providers over the years but are now thinking they look mighty, mightily expensive when you compare to the DFM MPS world. And when you look at the results from the investment performance, they haven't been um, that much better than the DFM MPS. So why are we paying all of this money for? And I think Mifid too sort of re reiterates that to an IFA when he's looking at costs and charges and he can see the total cost of investing uh, effectively off platform for these private clients you know, it is quite an expensive position. So I see that as a great uh, opportunity for us as well. And that will be on top of the assets that are sitting in the UK platforms at this moment in time. So it would be assets that could be transferred to platforms and could be transferred into the Tatton type proposition. And then if we look to slide 21, 
um, you can see that you know we're, we're still the market leader was still up there uh, and, and and moving forward quite nicely you can see the competition the only one that I'd highlight the saying isn't competition is Parmenian I, I really don't understand why Parmenian is listed uh, on that because that's a wrap platform with an investment solution uh, bundled together um, whereas the rest of the uh, of the comp competition are fund managers as you can see um, but also you can see the levels of, of where they are compared to us. So we remain on top. Uh, that doesn't mean that, you know, we rest on our laurels. We, we're always looking to, to drive the business forward uh, and obviously want to be flexible in terms of giving the IFA all of the support that he needs. And we'll give you a few examples of that um, a bit further on. Um, I made a comment, um, this is slide 22 now, I made a comment about wanting Tatum to become a true asset manager uh, and that kind of um, sort of blew back in my face a little bit because people were saying, you know, I thought, what do you mean a true asset manager? I thought you were one. And what I really meant to say was, you know, we, we are a DFM MPS um, dominated proposition, but we do have an OIC range and that OIC range is increasing in size. And under the M&A activity that we want to achieve utilizing the funding and the cash that we have, we want to take more and more of these OICs into and buy them under our control. But if you look at where we are now, we've got blended funds, we've got the Symphonia range that we bought from the Tenet Group, we've got our AIM portfolios, we've got our bespoke portfolios, and we've got OAK funds. So, you know, you can see that we're more than just a model portfolio um, service, and we've got about 429 million of the, of, of the uh, 7.8 coming from there. Um, and to be honest, when you look at that, I mean, well, that's at 50 odd bips. So that 429 is worth probably around, around about 1.5 billion in, in MPS terms when you look at the <coughs> revenue from, from that. So we will be looking to extend that. We will look to buy uh, OIC ranges. We will look to buy uh, DFMs. We won't be looking to buy IFA businesses. Uh, we'll not join the consolidation play on that. That's not why people have bought our shares. They've bought our shares because they want us to be a true asset manager. Um, if you look at industry trends on slide 23, pretty much a similar slide to what we gave you before. And I think that's re really good news that there's no brand new headwinds or concerns that we have out there. There's nothing other than the concerns that we, we have as a business moving forward. You know, we expect the market to get more competitive. It's got to get more competitive on the back of the fact that it's such a big opportunity for everybody out there. Everybody can see this as the growth space. Um, so we expect uh, the competition to, to, to wake up and, and get more uncompetitive as we get to go through. We believe we have set the price. Uh, the price is the right price. We don't feel it's under any pressure, but it is the right price. Um, we've talked about COVID net flows. Um, Obviously, our net flows were, were averaging 94 a month. We're not averaging that now, but you know, when we get back to normality, that's where we'd expect to get to. The big question mark is how long before we get back to normality. Um, IFA consolidation will continue. Private equity are very interested in the UK wealth space and in particular the IFA space. And we've seen not numerous private equity houses entering into the consolidation world. That does mean that from time to time, we will have uh, a consolidator buying one of the paradigm and Tatton supporting firms. And therefore we, we run the risk of losing those, those assets, but you know, that's been continuing for some time. Um, so we've obviously got a little bit of a headwind on that, but also we have an opportunity in that if we can work with those consolidators and maybe form part of their panel of advisors around the investment piece, then we look to do that and we have got two or three conversations on underway at the moment with consolidators for us for us to actually power their investment solution some of them want to remain independent and offer a, 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 a an array of investment solutions rather than one in particular uh, and, and that that we see as, a, as an opportunity so it's uh, it's a double-edged sword when you look at ifa consolidation from that point of view I'd let Lothar cover the, you know, our <clears throat> position with passive and with ESG. Suffice to say that you know, our job really is to make sure that we've got the full choice available to the IFA out there. We remain completely agnostic about style uh, and you know, we remain 
there to actually give them the full range for them to choose what they believe is the most suitable portfolio for their client. That's their job, not ours. All we need to do is make sure that we have all of the uh, availability that they want and we listen to them constantly through, through the operation. So that takes us to industry, industry trends. I think my, my sort of penultimate slide really is, is all about um, where we are with our strategic direction what you can expect to see from us. Yes, there's plenty of organic growth, so we would expect to, to grow in line with that growing market. We've been growing at 20 odd percent uh, CAGR over the last three years, and we obviously expect to continue to get up to those levels, uh, obviously depending on where we are with the COVID position. Um, we also would look to have further strategic partnerships like the tenant deal, which has been so successful for us. Uh, and you know where we can have JVs with IFAs to 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 power their their, their DFM proposition, uh, or even partnering with platforms as well. So lots of talk around the strategic partnerships, lots of conversations that we have ongoing at the moment, but none of which we can actually put a name to just as yet. But there is plenty of work going on there, and I'm particularly pleased with that at the moment. And then we'd bolster that up with the M&A activity that's obviously relevant, complementary, and obviously earnings enhancing where we can put them uh, and add them to the FUM as we move forward. Um, Paul alluded to the fact that we had a, a really good look at um, a business, um, uh, obviously in lockdown, that was the Architas business of 5.5 billion. Uh, I think that proves to everybody the ambition that we have for the group, that we wanted to go down and take on an acquisition of, of that magnitude but that would have uh, added some lovely FUM to our existing FUM. And obviously we were, we were beaten to that by Lion Trust and I'm sure they'll be delighted with that purchase. But you know, we will maybe um, look to take maybe smaller uh, investments on board. Um, you know, maybe if we had anything from sort of 500, 250, 500 million and, and upwards, but uh, that, that's, that's an area that we believe we want to want to play in and and prove our worth in as well. So um, that's it for strategic uh, direction. Slide 25 is very much just an update on the growth of Paradigm Consulting and Paradigm Mortgages, which I think we've covered. Um, you know, just nice steady uh, performance. Um, Paradigm Consulting moving quite steadily away, and Paradigm Mortgages getting past that headwind of not being able to bring that valuation revenue in at the time when obviously everybody was seriously locked down. So I'll pause for breath and hand over to Lotar. There's my, my, my lovely growth uh, slide uh, that some of you might have seen before. Um, unfortunately now with a bit of a COVID kink, um, but I'm delighted that we have, uh, we positioned the portfolio such that they fully uh, participated in the market recovery that we had afterwards, together with the inflows, as Paul just said, we're now past that 8 billion mark that is, is there on that chart. So if we turn to the next slide, um, I've run this uh, slide before just to uh, quickly explain uh, and, and recap how our model works. Uh, we are very much that model portfolio based discretionary portfolio manager. So we run model portfolios on platform with a discretionary mandate from the end clients. Um, that's the bulk of our business. We now also have a, a successful and growing bespoke portfolio service, still using the scalable building blocks that we have from the MPS and the AIM portfolio service is also part of that. Um, the new bits are that we're now on 15 advisor-led platforms so almost every quarter. We're adding a new platform on which we are available to the clients. And as we said beforehand, um, we are now also uh, complementing our portfolio offering more and more with multi-manager funds for those platforms or legacy product wrappers where you just can't put a segregated fund-based portfolio. Um, the uh, little schematic at the bottom uh, just outlines how we might differ slightly from others, um, which is that Teton is a pure investment manager. We're not in that sense a wealth manager in that we do not hold the re relationship with the end client. Um, we do therefore not compete with the IFA, which tends to make the IFA slightly more comfortable with our proposition than with some others because there's not the risk 
that we might um, disintermediate them. So moving on to the next slide, um, there have been a few sector headwinds that Paul already mentioned. There was the COVID inertia initially that we managed to overcome to a fair extent through just leading um, the um, advisors by example, um, showing them how if we can do Zoom and Teams meetings with them, they can probably do that with their clients as well. Uh, I suspect um, their clients were also sometimes shown by their children and grandchildren how to keep in touch over Zoom and, and other means. Um, but it was initially a bit of a struggle to get things going. We saw that on the activity graph early on. Um, we've also seen though that um, activity levels are somewhat correlated with the market environment at the moment. So if the markets are relatively bullish going upwards, we see more activity from the advisors. The moment that things go a little bit less certain, a little bit more sideways. So this was particularly ahead of the US election. Now that Brexit isn't quite so clear and as the UK was going into partial lockdown um, you know it's going up and down but um, we therefore expect that we will continue to deliver on the inflows as we have in the first half year things can really only get better from here uh, that's at least our view with the arrival of the vaccine now and the US election is behind us and we've seen a certain turn in the markets rotation so things are getting better definitely from that perspective the other headwind that we have experienced are those consolidator firms that Paul mentioned early on, very well private equity funded, overflowing with the ability to buy new advisor firms. Advisors feel a bit insecure about the valuations in the future of their firm, so they're quite inclined to sell out at the moment, which does bring with it the risk for us of losing firms to those consolidators who sometimes have their own investment proposition, but more often than not, we also realize that actually it, it, it sort of serves as an introduction of us and of our very cost effective way of managing client assets in a centralized investment proposition. And that means that we've got various irons in the fire, if you like, at the moment of JVs or other corporations with those consolidators who realize that we can actually uh, make their new business model more cost effective than perhaps they had originally envisaged or been able to see. The third one um, has been that bifurcation of, of uh, returns, really, that we've had between the UK stock markets and the US and growth markets. And those who have been around for a little bit longer may even feel very much reminded of the time we had between 98 and 2000, when anybody with a bit of value in it and not enough US um, seemed to be underperforming. Now, the UK wealth management arena has traditionally always had a bit of a US, uh, UK home bias. And therefore, those portfolios that had that um, will have and have underperformed to those um, competitors with a global offering. And that has at times sometimes been a headwind. Uh, but at the same time, our global ethical portfolio range has benefited from that. And we have further complemented our overall portfolio range with a global portfolio option. So what we used to run is now termed classic. And we now also have the global portfolio option very much in the same way that we've said, well, we are not getting into that debate between um, investors and advisors, whether it's active or tracker. And similarly, we don't want to really get into the debate between um, is it UK biased or is it uh, globally focused, global cap weighted. If we carry on to the next slide, that just um, outlines the various activities that we've run over this very important period. So. We've already spoken about that sales activity graph there, the bottom week by week. And uh, above that, you can see the accompanying activities that we've, we've done. We've learned that actually um, the, right, the written comment that we, that we do a lot is, is well received, but um, video, little video messages are even um, more clicked on. Um, indeed, we've had 12,000 um, views of our uh, bi-weekly and quarterly video updates, which I found quite remarkable. Um, we have over 5,000 subscribers now to the Teton Weekly, but um, the feedback we've received was that the timeliness of our market updates and interpretation of what is happening in the market has really helped advisors to keep their clients informed and also um, prevent them from making that ultimate investment error of, of um, moving into cash at the wrong time and then perhaps sitting on the sidelines until it's all um, 
recovered. We're very, very proud to have been awarded for the fourth time the Money Facts Award for the best discretionary uh, fund manager. Um, that has not happened before, so that made us uh, very proud. On the proposition side, I've already mentioned the launch of the global portfolios, uh, that range, uh, but also we complemented our blended multi-manager fund range with two additional funds at the top and the bottom of the risk range. And um, as I mentioned before as well, we've uh, made inroads on a number of platforms. Importantly, also with our BPS service, our bespoke service, which is now available on Transact and Hubwise. Turning to the next slide, that shows the distribution of our assets across the product matrix. So we've added another line there, the Teton Global range, which has already attracted considerable assets and is now at 3% of our total assets under management. Uh, notable also the growth of the ethical range, which is now at 4% of our total assets under management. That may still not feel very much, but it is over 300 million overall. So um, we can open doors with um, ESG and ethical uh, portfolio fund managers uh, quite easily. And we get a lot of interest from the wider market from IFAs because with this um, proposition matrix, we're ticking all um, um, requirements that a um, IFA may bring uh, with their um, DDs, with their um, requirement sets uh, to us. So that has been a great introducer. And I think as the, um, the view around um, ethical and ESG modernization goes through um, the population, uh, not just the younger ones, but feeds up to the older generation, I think um, this will grow more. At the moment, this is going at the expense of the traditional Teton managed active, but importantly for us, they have all got the same margin. Um, the charge, the DFM charge is the same across um, the product range and therefore it doesn't actually matter to us too much. Uh, and that also explains why we can remain agnostic uh, whether a client and advisor opt for one or the other. Moving on to the next slide, We've got a overview just of our performance long term and the five years um, of our different risk profiles. As you can see, the global equity is a little bit off the scale there. Um, well, it is, as I explained early on, um, that bifurcation of returns between the UK and the US. So the global equity one always had the global cat weighted um, asset allocation and therefore at the moment in a slightly different environment. But as we can see in the right hand panel on a risk return basis, the key core models that we're running are very nicely aligned and above the ARC PCI peer group averages. The next page um, and that's my last page really, also shows how the ethical portfolios are at the moment blessed with uh, really, really strong performance, but that is down to their structural bias towards uh, growth, tech in the US, because the underlying investment universe of ethical investments is just very much tech heavy. It's also very growth heavy when you think about it. Not many banks, not many energy companies in that. And that also means they're very overweight and weighted towards the US and therefore the shorter term performance of them is at complete odds with what normally and on average is being held in UK uh, wealth management portfolio. So hence why that has that big divergence there in returns in the right hand panel for the last year. That's me. The last slide is sort of summarizing what we've already heard from Paul around our growth strategy. So I won't repeat that, um, but give back, hand back to, um, to Hannah. Thank you to all three of you. Um, I can see that you've um, answered some questions along the way, but perhaps for the benefit of those that are uh, listening back on the recording, um, we might put some of uh, them to you for you to to answer now. Um, we had one on share-based payment charges, which uh, at 1.6 million have increased significantly from last year. Um, could you perhaps give a little bit more detail again? I know we touched on it in the presentation, but I, I have seen it commented on elsewhere. Yeah, so, but, I mean, back in March, you know, beginning of COVID, um, you know, it was obviously a very difficult time for a number of businesses, uh, including ours, you know, at one point, you know, towards the end of February, we were at 7.8 billion um, AUM at that point. 
Um, obviously, when the um, the crash hit, you know, post sort of post COVID or the onset of COVID, our our AUM fell back by uh, one point one point three uh, billion, and that has a significant impact, obviously, uh, on our or has the potential to have a significant impact on our um, on our financial results. So at that point in time, at the end of March, what we had to do, uh, in line with our auditors, is release the provision that we'd made for share based charges up until that point, uh, simply because we couldn't see at that point in time, you know, the, um, or couldn't get comfort about what the impacts of COVID would be both on Titan, but also the paradigm business as well. So in line with many businesses at that point in time, um, you know, we deferred um, our forecast to June, actually, um, when we released our results. Um, a lot of companies also withdrew forecasts um, because of the same reason. But what that meant is when we released that provision, and as obviously our results for the first six months can, can testify, is the fact that we've recovered quite well. You know, so we're back up to the 7.8 that, that we were, you know, pre-COVID. Um, we're actually at 8.1 as we sit here today in terms of 8.1 billion of AUM. So we've, we've kicked on a little bit further since then. Um, and what it's been necessary is to re-implement that provision. So what that means is we've not only got the charge for this year in the accounts but we've also got the charge and catch up for previous years as well so um you know effectively that charge for in 2021 which is this financial year will be effectively about a million pounds from prior years and, so, and what is yeah. um the key metric influencing that is it is it share price or assets under management it's just it, what influences that cost effectively is our ability as a as a business to meet the performance targets that are set. So clearly, all bonuses and all long term incentive plans have some element of hurdle rate that you've got to get to. And really, you know, our hurdle rates are based around profitability for bonuses, annual bonuses, and then for the long term incentive plan, a mix of earnings per share growth and total shareholder return. And those will be set by the remuneration committee at, at correct yeah they're set independently by the remuneration committee yes okay we have another question here um could you explain where acquisitions are likely to come from um do you expect to see them coming from larger groups offloading uh, books of business or do you expect to see them coming from competitor companies i don't think it'll be competitor companies really um no i think it's more likely to be um basically people who have got fund management capability currently but maybe have gone down different routes and strategically it doesn't quite fit like it used to um i think it could also be smaller scale dfms that haven't got to the kind of level or size that they needed to get to to make it really work from a, from an operational gearing point of view uh, and also different oig ranges so I don't think it's going to be competition as such. I don't think we'll be buying com competition uh, FUM. I think it will be FUM that's sitting outside of that. Thank you. Um, the dividend that you're paying, uh, always well received, but looks to be ahead of your underlying cash generation. Uh, should we expect this to slow relative to earnings? No, I think the dividend is is you know is is, is there. Um, we would expect it to be in the normal shape. Uh, as previous years so what we've tended to do is do one third now and then effectively two thirds on the second half uh, and that that's exactly what we'd be looking to do um that, that, that i can't see that we'll be looking to change from that point of view so we've got another one here can you remind us what the dfm fee rates are that you're charging and how these compare to the likes of your competitors and, and hargreaves people like that so, so most most DFM uh, MPSs are priced around about the 20, 24 basis points mark. Um, some are 30, 36. Um, we have one um, one uh, group that has the same sort of price as us, which is the AJ Bell MPS service that sits on the AJ Bell platform only, and it, it is very new and and pretty small. Um, traditional discretionary fund managers tend to be around about 80 to 90, sometimes up to 100 basis points. And when we look at OCF, if you look at the OCF, a normal OCF for a client that's been intermediated, you tend to find that the IFAs take on average around about 75 basis points. 
Um, the platform is anything from sort of 25 to 35 um, and, and then our DFM fee. And then of course, the, depending on what the um, client style is, whether it's passive or active, you can add on the OCF of the underlying funds that the portfolios have within them. Um, so that could be anything from so something, you know, 15, 16 basis points right the way through to 45, 50. Okay, thank you. And as you're looking for um, further acquisitions, will the uh, regulator allow you to gear up your balance sheet? Uh, do, yeah, yeah. I'll pass over to Paul to answer that one. Yes, the answer, the answer to that is yes, but only to a certain extent, simply because of um, you know the capital adequacy. So we have significant headroom in our capital adequacy, and, and the level of debt that we've actually raised at this point in time enables us to, to to gear up our balance sheet sufficiently. Should we find a small acquisition? That said, any acquisition that we make will probably also um, include some form of um, equity as well. Indemnity for IFAs has increased over the last year. Uh, how will that impact happen going forward? No, I think, yes, professional indemnity costs for the IFA ha have increased. Um, it doesn't affect us because we don't, we don't actually contribute towards the professional indemnity costs for those firms. Those firms are directly authorised. It's their, their cost for their own individual balance sheets. So it wouldn't affect us. I think the only... Thing that could affect us obviously if the PI market got ridiculously priced and IFAs couldn't afford it and went out of business then ultimately that could end up uh, causing us a problem naturally but I don't foresee that being a, a real um, problem or real issue. Okay thanks. Um, now have you seen the trend towards passive management continue or is active management making a comeback during the pandemic? I think just to save transferring mics and so we have seen we have seen a bit of a change to, to passive it, it seems to be quite you know it doesn't seem to be gathering much more momentum than it had um Lothar had that slide for you which shows how it's moved I, I don't think it's gone the other way I don't think it's actually led more to active at this stage I think the, the direction of traffic has been more to reducing costs and therefore bringing more passives into portfolios uh, our most successful one is the core one, which is 50 passive, 50 active. Uh, and then the rest of the change has been towards ESG. So regardless um, of any switches at the moment, Tatton's well placed for both. Yeah, I mean, as I said earlier, the, the whole idea for us is to give the whole choice, the whole menu, so that the IFA can choose along with his client what is the most suitable portfolio for him, which is the most suitable risk category and also which is the best style for him. Lovely. Well, I think we'll wrap up there. Thank you all for joining us. Um, as a reminder, we did uh, publish a note at lunchtime today. So if you would like to see our forecasts, you can find them on our website uh, and we will be releasing the recording again uh, later on today or tomorrow morning if you'd like to watch it back. Uh, otherwise, thank you, gentlemen, for joining us and we look forward to hearing and updating another six months time. Thank you very much, thank Hannah. Very much. Thanks, thanks. thanks to the audience. Thank you. Cheers. Bye bye.